to make your way over to Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. We're beginning in verse 17. So as we begin looking at verse 17 tonight, we will uh, uh, need to let you know that uh, Paul has, in chapter 16, talked about love and greeting people with love and and uh, he comes into verse 17 he wants us to know that godly love does not rejoice in unrighteousness 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 6 it has a by its very nature love warns against harm to those whom it loves uh, love is always ready to forgive evil but love does not condone or, or uh, ignore it. You know, a lot of times we think we're doing somebody good by keeping our mouth shut when we see something terrible going on, but uh, that's just not love. Love makes some kind of interdiction. That's what Paul is saying here when he says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to doctrine which you learn and avoid them. So he comes and he asks us to, to, if we truly love somebody, especially in the church, um, we need to strive for what is good for them and opposed to whatever is evil for them. Paul's urging at this very moment is, is against those who would call the fit. See, not everyone who was working uh, with Paul uh, to spread the gospel some people were false teachers. We think mostly of the Judaizers, those who uh, refused to let the Gentiles become Christians because they thought they needed to become Jews first. And Paul says these were the people who would follow him around. Again, remember, he's writing this from, from Corinth. And so he had plenty of Judaizers there. There's plenty of Judaizers everywhere else. And they would come in and they would uh, take the word that had been given and they would twist it a little bit and and uh, tell folks they couldn't come to Christ the way Christ had said they could come to them. And the words are, are very particular here, called division, sedition. That division is, is those people who divide and offensive is the same word for stumbling block. So how do they do that? They divide and they apply stumbling blocks. What do they do? They try to figure out how to twist something. Thank you, if you will, about the Garden of Eden. Now, Paul's not really talking about this, but we can certainly see how Adam and Eve's story at the beginning there plays into what Paul's talking about here. Here, these people had been given the truth. They had been taught the truth. They knew what the truth was. Um, he had, uh, they had been full of the apostolic teaching that they had received, and and Paul wanted them to hold to that. Adam, Eve, they knew the truth. They got to walk in the cool of the evening with the Lord himself. Here comes Satan and begins to uh, bring with him uh, uh, contrary doctrine to what God said. God told him not to eat of the fruit of the tree of good and evil or the fruit of the tree of chaos and he adds that little bit when he's talking to Eve. Hath not God said? You know, has God said? Did he really say that? Is that what he really meant? Again, trying to divide, right? Trying to put some kind of division there. And then they go on to, uh, to try to put a stumbling block in their way. Right? Here's what God really wants. He don't want you to become like him. He's trying to keep you from your full potential. That's how that works, a, a little bit of that. But the truth is that they had the truth. And, and what, what's his, what's his uh, response to that? Contrary from the doctrine of what you learned, you received this apostolic teaching, and he wanted to warn them about those who challenged or tried to undermine that teaching. They had divinely received this teaching. Paul had taught them. They had got it from some other people to come through. They certainly had the word of God at their hands. They had been living so much so that the world knew uh, that they had a great reputation for, for love and a great reputation for determining the truth and being obedient to the truth. That was just built into that 
Roman nature, right? And that's what made them such a, 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 a cohesive fighting unit. That's what made them such great conquerors as when they were right at it, they had an ability to, to understand that obedience was important to get anything done. So that carried right into the church. But not only did that carry into the church, the idea of obedience, but also all these people come from all different walks of life, all different uh, um, doctor, all different um, religions and all different paganism things and all that stuff. So they had to be really focused on staying unified if they were going to be able to be obedient. So what's Paul's warning? What's the correct way to deal with those who would bring in some kind of division or, or something contrary to doctrine or, or lay down a, a, a stumbling block, an offense, if you would? He says for you to avoid them. Now you think, well, what am I supposed to do? I need to engage them. Love engages that. No, love will do its very best to protect people. Love will do its very best to to warn people, but you personally, somebody who, uh, especially immature in faith, right? Somebody who's not a theologian, uh, don't get caught there and sit there. Just get up and leave. Paul gives us an example of how to do that, but think about how that works. You got these people who come to your door on Saturday morning dressed in white or however they decided to come up that day, they knock on your door and they just want to give you a little pamphlet. Their little pamphlet, that, uh, we're all talking about the same Jesus, and we're all almost using the same Bible. If we can go back uh, and they pull out their Bible, and their Bible's a little bit more, uh, what they say, a little bit more closer to the original. And they take and they begin to, to take that, uh, that uh, stumbling block, they begin to take the words, and they begin to lay them beside what you know, and pretty soon they've been trained. They've been taught how to deal with folks, how to fluster people, how to put them on, on their heels. And now all of a sudden, instead of avoiding them, they'll say, why don't you just get off my porch? No, I don't really want to do that. No, I'm not giving you two cents for nothing. Instead of doing that, we let them in the house, and, and then they call us those stumbling blocks. And then we begin to doubt the, the things that we learn. And we get led astray. We get pushed off. So we just need to avoid them. Again, the, the Bible is always uh, trying to tell us that, that uh, we need to avoid those who cause division, those who are foolish, those who won't believe the truth. We just need to, to get away from them. Don't deal with that stuff. Just get away from them. Verse 18 says, because they don't have your good mind. They don't really love you. They're not doing this because they want you to, to get a closer relationship with Jesus. Verse 18 says, for those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? They're not serving God. God's people who are not in the business of causing division are putting stumping blocks in everybody's way. So if you begin to see division and stumping blocks Fences coming up, and you can believe that these people do not have Christ's church in mind here, but their own bellies, right? They serve their own appetite, that thing that, that gets them juice up. Maybe they need a, a personal following, or, or maybe they're, they're getting some money off of it. And how do they do this? How do they feed their own appetite? By smooth words and flattering speech, right? How they do it? By twisting. How did Satan do it? By twisting. He's the father of lies. If he tells a lie, he told it of himself. And that's what he is. He's a murderer from the beginning. It, that's how he works. And it's easier to talk somebody talk somebody out of something sometimes than it is to, than it is to take it by force. Right? That's why we have con artists. That's why we have all the phone scams. That's why your email pops up with this Nigerian prince who's got $300,000 that he can't deal with, but he'll put it in your account if you'll just, and you can have most all of it if you'll just send him $50,000 back. Right? Sounds too good to be true, right? Usually he is. So, so who do they deceive? They deceive the heart of the sinner. 
See, God has His Word, His truth, and God indwells His people with His Spirit. And our problem is that we don't dive enough in the Word to know the truth. How do we know the truth? We don't have to know everything. And what's the old saying about <coughs> how they determine what a counterfeit dollar is? The people in the IRS, the people in the Treasury Department who do those kind of things, they don't sit around <coughs> trying to figure out what every defect in every dollar bill could possibly be to recognize. What to do is they study every detail of what the real dollar is. They know what the real truth is so that when they see, right, when they see something a little off kilter, maybe the color of the paper is just a little off, or maybe there's a symbol a little off, or a watermark a little off, or something else a little off, they can instantly, not because they know what the counterfeiter was trying to do, but they knew what the counterfeiter couldn't do, and that is make a genuine copy. That's why, uh, you know, people will be talking all the time, you know, you can misquote stuff, like say it's in the Bible. Now, I, I don't know every. I, I don't know every verse in the Bible. I really don't. If you ask me where something is, especially in the New Testament or our story, Elijah, Elisha, something like that, I can usually find it for you pretty easy. You know, I know in a general direction. But I tell you what I do know. I know enough of this word. I know enough of this truth. I hear enough in his heart that I know what it doesn't say. Right? You know, you know what it says, God. Helps those who help themselves. That's not in the Bible. God helps those who, who can't help themselves, who are at the end of the rope, who have given up. Now, does he expect you to do better? Does he expect you to mature? Does he expect you to get over it? Yes. But he's going to be, have to be the one that pulls you out of the miry pit and put a new heart, saw, a new heart in you and set your feet on firm ground. That's how that works. So when we come and we begin to to look at how that happens over and over again, our problem is that we do not study the Word of God enough. We don't hide enough of it in our heart. We don't know the genuine article, so it's hard for us to to to, uh, to see the fake article. It's hard for us to get a hold of what's fake, because we don't know what's true. Paul Remington said it. He says, verse 19, for your obedience has become known to all. Again, what's the number one thing that they had in Rome? They were obedient. They knew how to follow directions. They knew what to do. And that's Romans 16, verse 19. Uh, that's where we're at, Romans 16, verse 19. So, he said, and, and everybody knows your obedience. You are, you are picking up that divinely revealed truth that's been laid down for you and people are seeing that in your lives. They're seeing that in the way you're operating the church. They see that over and over again. He says, therefore, I'm glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. Matches what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 verse 16 when he said, I send you out and I want you to be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves, right? Romans 12, 19, Paul has already said that, uh, 12, 9, I'm sorry. Romans 12, 9 says, Let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, and cling to what is good. See, God has a way of, of making those bad memories go away. God has a, a way of taking those bad times and, and putting them behind us. If we truly accept his forgiveness for all our sins, right? You know the story. I, I hadn't been able to quite forgive myself for something I, I had done. I, I let that stuff bubble up and bubble up and bubble up. And, and basically what I'm saying is, God, you just can't forgive me of this. Well, talking to somebody, and they said, you know, you, you don't have a high opinion of God, right? You don't have a high opinion of God. God said he could forgive other things. He said he'd take it away from you. told him to forgive you. What you need to do is forgive yourself and accept the forgiveness that God's already given you, right? See, love is, is, is ready to forgive all evil. Jesus died for me. He loved me. He ready to get rid of that, ready to forgive me. He had long since forgiven me. All I need is claim that forgiveness. Well, you know the story. Coming back from Durant, bridge. And I'm thinking to myself, that's all i got to do, right? 
is ask the Lord to forgive me, accept the forgiveness that He's already got. I can be all this stuff. I say it on this side of the bridge, I'm driving 60 miles an hour. Before I get to the end of the bridge, uh, the weight of the world has been lifted off my shoulders, right? Why is that? Uh, because God's able to change the way we think, change our outlook, so that we're able to, to be wise concerning what's good. He wants us to, to really look into what's good, to find those things that are good, and, and, and be simple about enjoying the good things in life. And what's he say? And simple concerning evil. Simple concerning evil. If it's bad, it's bad. You don't have to dig around in the garbage pile to realize that it's garbage, right? You know, I give myself a little conviction. Sometimes I, I watch movies that I may be a little more bored than what they should be. I don't need that trash in my house. I don't need it in my mind. I don't need it in my heart. If I'm wise about what's good, I understand this. You don't find pearls in a, in a, in a hawk. You go look for pearls by the seashore where the oysters are. And better yet, if you got some money, you just go to the jewelry store. That's where you find it. Says, I need to be wise about where I'm going, and I need to be simple about what's evil, right? Some things are just evil. I know there's some places I should not go, some things I should not do, and I should just be simple about it. Somebody says, well, you know, you can get away with that. You don't have to worry about that. Ain't nobody watching you about that. No, I'm, I'm too simple about evil. I know they don't take a whole lot to hook this fish. <laughs> you know, I never would have got any size if I were in the pond. I would have jumped every one that come on, uh, on, on, the, on the line. You know, I just, I, I couldn't control myself. So I would have been hooked, but now I'd rather not be hooked. And I just want to be simple concerning what's evil and wise about what's and then in verse 20 says, and the God of peace, who is God? We've talked about this voice. We, we looked at it when he called him the God of peace and the God of mercy here in chapter 15. This is a <coughs> recurring thought that God wants us to have about God. Whatever was going on in Rome, whatever turmoil was happening, he needed them to understand that God was a God of peace. And if they were worshiping him and they were following after him and they were truly obedient to him. The winds and the waves could howl and rage but there would be a peace that surpasses understanding. He said, now, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Again, back to Genesis. Talking about the devil's seed and the woman's seed. The promise was that, uh, that uh, the serpent would bruise the woman's seed but that the, uh, uh, that the uh, woman's seed would crush the serpent's head. Again, we go back to what we, we know about Satan. There is there's nothing equal about him and God. He is on a leash, must have permission to touch us, anything that we have. He knows his time is short, and he roars around uh, like a roaring lion, seeking who he can destroy, and he likes to herd people off, isolate them and insulate them from their family and friends, and, uh, and make them weak and make them vulnerable. He likes to do that kind of stuff. But Paul said whatever's going on, uh, Satan will certainly one day be crushed. He'll be dealt with shortly. Be taken care of, out of the way. I don't know how the mystery of iniquity works. I understand that there's 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 a need for Satan to to do what he does. Uh, you can't have light, I guess, without darkness. I mean, I, I don't know. That's not in the Bible either. But you know, whatever. I mean, not trying to be ir irreligious, but I mean, we there's a, there's an evil, and God has a plan for Satan, just like He has a plan for us. And Satan roaring and raging. Yet he's following every path and hitting every buzzer that God wants him to do. Someone had asked me this afternoon uh, about when was the age of Antichrist. Well, for me, the age of Antichrist comes after the church is raptured. But Satan never knew what time the church was going to be raptured. He didn't even know anything about the church. To uh, Acts chapter 2, and he said, oh, my goodness, the we got something going on here. We need to put a kink in it, right? Now, but ever 
sense that he knew that God was working on something. He gets Pharaoh to, to kill every man or child of Moses. He gets all the, the kings of, of, of uh, Judah together. And one, one of the ladies, one of the queens there, Athena, she tries to kill every male child who belongs to the line of David except one. Here, Herod finds out somebody in the New Testament who has a star that appeared in the sky. And wise men come and worship him. What happened? He tries to kill everybody under the age of two, but Jesus is now safe in Egypt. God had warned Joseph to go down there with his family. So, he doesn't know what's coming. So, every age could be the age of Antichrist. He's always got his plan in place, and he's just waiting for the restraining hand of the Spirit to move out of the way so he's able to do that. He's waiting for you and I to disappear off this earth and he knows it's go time and then he brings his man of sin, this man of iniquity, the son of perdition, uh, into place this Antichrist. Not just, not just against Christ, but one who wants to replace Christ. And we'll look at that. But anyway, so whatever he's got going on, his plans are, are, are in God's sight and his days are numbered. And he says, Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And then he comes and he greets some more of his friends and he has this list here. And uh, each of them, you know Timothy, his fellow worker, Sepater and, and Tertullus and uh, Gatius and This is like one of the longest benedictions you'll ever find. He's been trying to wind this thing down since chapter 14. <clears throat> He's about ready to. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. Well, who's able to do that? That's got to be the Holy Spirit, right? According to the revelation by the mystery kept secret since the world began. Now, what is that? What was, what was Paul able to reveal that nobody else knew, nobody else saw? What is that? Ephesians chapter 3. I'm going to show you that mystery. For Paul, it wasn't something that was kept secret. It's just something that people didn't see. Ephesians chapter 3. Your subtitle might say, Mystery Revealed. Anybody say that in the Bible? Yes. Okay. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of, of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, remember this is Ephesians, it's a prison epistle, so he's in Rome in prison. If indeed I have heard of the dispensation of grace which was given to you, and that dispensation is stewardship or administration of grace, what, what is that? Something God has given to me for you. How that by revelation, right? According to the revelation. How by revelation he has made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already by which you read uh, you may understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ which in other ages have not been made known to the sons of man as it has been revealed by the spirit to his holy apostles and the prophets that Gentiles should be, that's the mystery, that Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body. What is the mystery that the Jews and the Gentiles were to be united in the body called church? Nobody saw it. Satan didn't have any idea it was coming to Pentecost. He had no idea what was going to happen when he killed Christ on the cross. I remember Carmen, uh, he was a singer, may still be alive, he, he uh, he sung a song, and part of the, the lyrics was that uh, that the devil was asking one of his demons to, to look in on Jesus when he was in the tomb. He says, hey, hey, Satan, that demon's dead, <laughs> right? And then all of a sudden, the thing goes, Friday night, they crucified the Lord, and then by Sunday night, you know, you know the, the tomb, Sunday morning, the tomb rolled away, and Jesus is free, and had no idea what was going on. It was a secret. God had folded in. Now, us looking back in the scriptures, we can see, we can find where God intended 
for the Jews and Gentiles to get together. We can see where Christ was going to make a way for all of us, right, to get to heaven. We can see that, but but Paul is able to, to let these people know at Rome that that's his good news, that, that they didn't have to listen to the Judaizers. They didn't have to be Jews first. All they had to do is believe in Christ. And the adjustments they had to make to their life was, was not to fall back into rituals and not to eat certain foods. The, food, the, the, the thing they had to get a hold of is they had to be wise concerning what was good and simple concerning what was evil. They were to abhor that which was evil and cling to that which was good. They were to be as wise as serpents in dealing with people and yet harmless as doves as they went around this world. Their whole idea, the truth that needed to get out in every corner was that was that the, that the Christians were, were to be established by the truth and they were to share that truth with others. That's all Paul asked those folks at Rome to do. That's all God asked us to do. If we say that we're naming the name of Christ, according to, uh, to Paul as he talks to Timothy in 2 Timothy, let all those who name the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Means we're to mature. It may take a little while, but we steady need to be sanctified, getting away from sin. Verse 26. But now made manifest. Why is it made manifest? Paul's been able to say it, and we can see the church. To make something manifest is to be able to see it. So those people at Rome, those Jews and those Gentiles worshiping together at Rome made manifest the mystery that Paul's been talking about. And by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations. What prophetic scriptures? What were the only scriptures they had? Anybody? Old Testament. Again, Paul says it was spoken of. God's always had this as his intention. Was this thing called the church? Made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God. For obedience to the faith. Why was he commanding them? He was commanding them because uh, your obedience has become all, uh, known to all. Here it is. Obedience to faith. What faith? The faith that God uh, sent his son to die on the cross, lived a holy, perfect life, deity become flesh, incarnate, made flesh, died on the cross, rose the third day, was seen by as many as 500 at one time after his resurrection, who sent his spirit on the day of Pentecost to indwell believers, has his word in front of us so that we have God's truth and God's divine indwelling spirit so that we can grow and mature and be obedient in faith and avoid those people who cause division and offenses and lay down strong and blocks. We avoid them because we know what the truth is. Now he gets real happy and says, to God alone. Right? This, this, is, this is the only one who deserves this. To God alone, wise. The wise God, the one who had planned all this thing out. <clears throat> the one who has been the mastermind. The, 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 the one who's had his hand on it from the beginning. The one who spoke it out of nothingness. The one who has slain his son from the foundation of the land, this, this, the foundation of the earth. Uh, this God alone wise, who's wise? God alone is wise, be glory. Right? Through Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because when we see Jesus, that's what he does. He directs all of that. All the people that have been saved, all the miracles that have been done, all the giving of the Holy Spirit, all of that goes through Christ and Christ directs it to his Father so that his Father may have all the glory. Now, you get the book of Revelation, you see the Father turns around and gives all the glory back to the Son. So, they're up there. However that works out, and the glory is coming through Jesus to the Father, the Father turns around and gives it to the Son, and, and there's his glory everywhere. His glory on every street. Woo! What street do you live on? I live on Forest Street. 
Yeah, it's right down that street of gold over there. Hey, it's sure as bright out here. Well, that's because the sun gives light to everything. That's the S-O-N because the S-U-N is going to burn out. No need for it anymore. And how long will that glory go on through Jesus Christ? Anybody? Forever. And all Paul could do is say, Amen. So be it. That is a 